gets underrated in a while. Yeah. And and people don't uh people we get excited about two and seven and eight and nine because they've got a lot of good prophecy in it. Uh uh this one has sort of a, a helper thing too about prophecy, so I'm excited about that one too. Uh, one of the things I wanted to mention is that uh, several of you are on a um, have been coming to uh, continuing courses, uh, and because of that, several I don't know it was just eight to ten Eddie somewhere in there uh, people yeah. were um, qualified so far for the uh, iPad drawing. So uh, it's be a it'll be a new iPad, and uh, I think we just said it was a uh, ten consecutive, the first ten consecutive, and uh, right. so we don't want you to miss out. <laughs> uh, so if you're if you've been going along steadily, then uh, keep on coming so you can be be a part of that drawing. Uh, yeah. Do we want to mention about the uh, three huh? gifts? Uh, Daniel seven through nine. Well, uh, Eddie, uh, yeah. Eddie has been a proponent uh, of making sure that we, um, uh, I guess, mentioned this uh, that we we're thinking about, and we, I guess we're going to do it. Uh, seven, eight, and nine are critical uh, chapters in the uh, to fill in the uh, baseline before we get into Revelation, and uh, so. As far as chapters, you definitely want to hit seven, eight, and nine, or them, them. Uh, so that's coming up uh, the week after next. And uh, we, and if uh, uh, if you want to be part of the drawing for this cool book, Eddie, I don't really have the book with you. I don't have one with me. Yeah, I've got it here. Uh, we're actually going to give maybe a couple of these away. I don't know. Can you? Yeah, it's, it's a very thick book. But it's one What's of the, called? I think it's called uh, Revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, yeah, it's a commentary. Uh, Larry and Charlie and I have been re reading it. And it's a very fair, very studious work. I think you'll, uh, if you can read through this, you really uh, will get some great information. I think we're going to give away a couple of these. It's very it's, uh, well written. It's a it's a yeah, it's a it's a really insightful book and in fact I was uh doing some reading in Revelation last night in preparation for my discussion today <laughs> so uh, just to get some more background anyway about so, six hundred pages it's worth uh, about fifty bucks yeah yeah I think I don't think you can find it for less and thank you Evelyn and Barbara good to have you here as well greetings um, thank you uh, I'm a uh, would uh, someone like to have opening prayer for us before we begin? Uh, and watch me pick out Evelyn. Evelyn, would you have opening prayer for us? Oh, you have to take it off mute. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. All right. Evelyn, Father, Lord, we <clears throat> come before you tonight just thanking you first for allowing us to be on this Zoom together. Lord, I ask that you send your Holy Spirit through the through the computers so that we can learn more so that we can understand more and that we can all be on the same page, Father. I ask that you remove all distractions from this study so that we can focus on you and Lord, whatever and all that we do, Lord, let us get understanding of your word. And I ask this and I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks. Everybody. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Um, so we're, we moved on to chapter five of Revelation and it's it's known as the one where we see the hand writing on the wall. And if you notice, I, I spell check kept on trying to me trying to merge the word hand and writing to call it handwriting. And going, the important thing is that whose hand was doing the writing. So that's why I decided to keep them separate so you could see that. Uh, we have the facilitators. Uh, we know we're doing the King James, uh, the New King James version as our, as our base. And let's uh, begin with an introduction to Daniel 5. Uh, in this chapter, um, we see a, tr a transition of power that's about to happen. You know, we we saw a, a little discussion of that earlier in Daniel 2, that it was going to happen. And it was in the dream given to Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, the head of gold was going to be replaced by the two-armed uh, uh, Medo-Persian Empire. And in, in this, 
this episode in the Bible and in sort of the history we see has been immortalized in our language. Uh, you know, we often hear the expression, I saw the handwriting on the wall. And what do we mean by that? That knows it's, we know something's about to happen. <laughs> right. We all, we, all know right. we all know that it's an expression that almost everyone agrees is a pronouncement that uh, something's just about to happen. It, it all, there's all the signs are there, right? So uh, I'm going to take, uh, take, take note and act accordingly. And so when the fingers of, hand, of the hand moved uh, that night to write on the wall, uh, it, you might think that was the only time that's ever happened where the fingers have written something on something very hard like a stone wall or something. But ha ha have we seen that before somewhere? Yes, we have from Mount Sinai. Yeah, Moses. Mount Sinai, exactly. We saw uh, God write on tablets of stone. And it says here in Exodus 31, 18, and when he had made an end of speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. And so these 10 commandments or uh, gifts on how to live happy life, as I call them, uh, are far part of his eternal covenant and they're written in stone with his hand. And I think there's something, when we think about this, there's an encounter here with Moses with God that turns out one way, but it has something similar in a way. We can sort of learn something about the encounter with Belshazzar, I think. So we, I'm gonna keep that in the back of my mind as we go forward. Okay, so we're in the closing scenes uh, for Babylon. It's been 20 years uh, since uh, chapter four, where we saw last week, we saw uh, Nebuchadnezzar saying, isn't this great Babylon I built? And then he was immediately uh, sent, went crazy really, and sent out to graze in the grass for seven yeah. years and, and came back humbly and acknowledged God for who he is and praised God for that. But 20 years later, we have another king. Uh, this is the son, or actually the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. So there was a... Uh, Merodic, I guess, who reigned 23 years. And, uh, but now we have Belshazzar. Uh, he is the king, if you will, over the, this, the city of Babylon at this point. Okay. So one of my questions when I was preparing for this was, so who was surprised? <laughs> Should anyone have been surprised that this event was going to happen? Um, and the reason I say that in Jeremiah 51, uh, there's a prophecy uh, that Jeremiah wrote 100 years before uh, that speaks about the downfall of Babylon. And then surprisingly, uh, and this for those people who haven't seen this before, uh, Isaiah wrote down that God called Cyrus to be his anointed one. And his job was to go take Babylon, Babylon down and even told him how he was going to help him. Uh, and that was given before Cyrus was even born. And then we have the Daniel 2, the foundational prophecy that lays out the history of the world uh, and says, oh, Babylon can be followed by an inferior kingdom, just like silver is inferior of gold. And then we have Daniel 7. Now, I realize we haven't got to 7 yet because that's later on in the, in the, in the, the book. But we don't, many people don't realize that seven, the events of Daniel 7 actually occurred before Daniel mm -hmm. 5. So in fact, the Daniel 7 was written in the first year of Belshazzar's reign. So Daniel had an extra bit of knowledge about what was going to happen. Uh, the vision uh, that Daniel has, and I think Eddie's going to cover that later, uh, actually sort of repeats a lot of what we see in Daniel 2, but it expands to give more information. And one example is that in Daniel 7, you see a winged lion beast uh, that's followed by a bear raised up on one side. And one might ask, well, what is that trying to tell me with the bear raised up on one side? Well, 
what it could tell you is that one side of this bear was stronger than the other, just like the Persians were stronger than the, Medo <laughs> the, the Medes. And so you see that a little bit more information is coming in when we repeat and expand, but we'll get in that when we go follow in, uh, in seven later on. And then we have, in Daniel 5, we have this handwritten note uh, in which the kingdom is expressly given to the Medes and the Persians. So I was going to look at a few of these. I said Jeremiah 51. This was written 100 years ahead of time. And this is Jeremiah the prophet. He uh, commanded that what he wrote was going to be taken off. And so in verse 60 here, it says, Jeremiah wrote in a book all the evil that would come upon Babylon and all these words that are written against Babylon. And I guess as a, as a homework study, I would say read 50, 51 and you'll see the detail about what it's talking about, the destruction of Babylon. It's pretty graphic and right on very accurately. Uh, so it tells you how Babylon was going to be destroyed. And it goes on. Then Jeremiah said, uh, he says, when you arrive at Babylon, see to it that you read these words. And they said, oh, Lord, you have spoken against this place to cut it off. So that none shall remain in it, neither man nor beast, but it shall be desolate forever. And that's part of this vision of what's going to happen to Babylon, which is so true. It ended up being desolate. And he tells uh, his, uh, this guy, he says, now take this down, tie a stone to what you have written and throw it into the Euphrates. Thus Babylon shall sink and not rise from the catastrophe that I will bring upon her, and they shall be weary. Thus far, are, thus far are the words of Jeremiah. I was actually doing a little reading today, a little bit more on the history of Babylon, and there was an earlier version of this, of Babylon, and then there's the Neo-Babylonian uh, era, which is, which is where Nebuchadnezzar came in. But after that, Babylon was never able to be a free and independent uh, uh, city or country again after that. So it never, never happened. And then the final was destroyed. Um, it's interesting that he said to throw it into Euphrates because the Euphra Euphrates, it was going to go, uh, it was going to sink and not rise from the catastrophe. The Euphrates was interesting as far as Babylon's going. If you've never seen a picture of Babylon, uh, it has high walls. I mean, these walls are I forget how high, but incredibly high, incredibly thick. I mean, and, uh, and it has two sets of walls. So it has an interior set of walls and, and an exterior set of walls. Uh, and it was considered impossible to get into, but it did have the Euphrates River flowing through it. And so as it flowed through it, that was a life of the city, it brought trade and brought goods. And of course they brought water into the city and they had it all locked up, but you know, the, this, this gives you a hint and alludes to the fact that Cyrus is going to use the Euphrates to, uh, to take Babylon. And that's exactly what we see. Because in, here in Cyrus, here in Isaiah 45, we see Cyrus being, Cyrus being called. Uh, and it says, Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him and to loose the armors of kings, to open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. So I will go before you. Who has not heard of this thing before about Cyrus? I, you know, I'm, I'm having to look both ways, but yet, has anyone never heard about Cyrus being, the, being called by God to be the one to knock Babylon off? Everyone has heard this before. Okay. I, I am, uh, I, whenever, whenever, whenever I think about this, it gives me a, a little bit of shivers because not only does it say, I'm calling you to do it, he tells him that, guess what? I'm going to make sure the doors are unlocked. And these doors are the doors that protect Babylon from things coming in from the Euphrates, right? It's got, it had walls and gates in, in, in basically along the river to keep people from just willy-nilly coming in. You had to be let in. And that night, the gates were shut, just like God said. And Cyrus marched up to Euphrates. So it's, it's just, it's just amazing to me. <laughs> so this this is a prophecy before 
before they even knew there was, this was going to before they even knew that Babylon was going to be a problem. This is a prophecy that uh, was given, and it sort of talks about how we can think about prophecy. You know, the apostles used prophecy to demonstrate the Messiah, and uh, you know when he came and they used the Old Testament to tell you who the Messiah was. Uh, and because they knew that the prophecy would be true, you know, we see this as being true, and we know the other prophets about Jesus were true. So then we go to Daniel two, and we we remember this the story. The, the king had this vision, uh, and uh, you know, the head of gold, the image, and then the, the arms of silver, uh, and, and the belly of brass, and the you know the legs of iron, and, and so forth. And we see this is the first transition, the transition being from gold to silver is about to happen, and the Medes and the Persians are about to take over. Uh, in Daniel 7, what you're going to see is, it's going to, instead of talking about metals, it's going to talk about uh, beast. And the beasts do tend to be ways that God refers to different uh, kingdoms and governments. But here you have, the first one was uh, a winged lion. And that's very appropriate because the Babylonian symbol for themselves was a winged lion. <laughs> so if you had any guess, doubt about who that was, it was pretty easy. And then you had the bear, and like I said, the bear raised up on one side, and, there's, and uh, we see it being Medo-Persia. So, um, so we see all this stuff has happened before the event takes place. Uh, and then you have, whoops, yeah, that's all that happened before. So, any questions before we start the verse for verse study? Okay. So here we go. It's, it's time to get on now. Now here's here we're going to stage the event. You're you are in a city that's being besieged by an army, and they they've surrounded you. And so, what is your reaction? Well, it's to call a party, of course. You know, everyone would do that, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to have a party. <laughs> so, so now, as wild as it seems for them, it made sense because they had right. the walls of they had the walls of Babylon. No one's right. going to get through those, right? Right. They had storehouses of food that could last for years and years, and they had water from the Euphrates. I mean, let's have a party. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Belshazzar the king made a great feast for thousands of his lords and drank wine in the presence of the thousands. And while he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold, the silver vessels, what his father, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken from the temple, which had been in Jerusalem, that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Now, I have a little mark here that oftentimes father means grandfather. In this case, that would be exactly right. Belshazzar was a grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. But yeah, so Nebuchadnezzar had taken the vessels from the temple, right? These are holy vessels. And and after, you know, I don't know how long, we don't know how long they were into the party before Belshazzar says, I've got a great idea. You know, let's bring those uh, vessels over that the... Uh, that these guys think their God, you know, thinks are holy, and we're going to just show him a thing or two. We're going to start drinking from him. Um, so he. Uh, you said last night, Charlie, when we were studying this together, yeah, <clears throat> that this was kind of a Belshazzar's in the face of God type moment. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you, I mean? That's yeah. I, actually, I have a little thing here. Do you, do you see a potential problem? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> with what King Belshazzar plans to do, because yeah, he's he's basically throwing it in God's face. Uh, we're going to see later on that Belshazzar knows the stories, right? He uh, he's the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, right? And when he's introduced to Daniel, you know, he says, "Oh yeah," basically, he knows what he's doing, right? This is this is not an an act of ignorance. He is taking holy things and sticking it in God's face, right? Defiance. Yeah. Defiance. Defiance. Uh, well, here, here's something else. and I, uh, So we're, we're going to talk about this a little bit, so we'll talk about it right now. Um, they are faced with an army that's, you know, trying to destroy them. Now, granted, they think they're okay, but what is their confidence in, right? 
their confidence in their walls. Yeah, their confidence, as you see, it's going to be in their gods of gold, silver, and so forth. Uh, and they're not calling out to the God, the creator God, to the holy God of Daniel, whatever you want to say that Nebuchadnezzar talked about, and not calling to him. And yet they've had over and over again instances where God has shown his his reliance, his love, and that they can trust him and that, you know, they should go to him. And he, yeah, he, he stands in his face and says, uh, -uh we got this God. We're not going to do that. <clears throat> yeah. So then they brought the holy God, the holy, they brought the gold vessels, which had been taken from the temple of the house of God, which Hi. had been in Jerusalem. Now, this is all, when I get this, I'm thinking, they're taking holy vessels that were in the presence of God, right? Because that's where the priest and the, the priest went. And then during the high priest went during the Day of Atonement, went into the sanctuary in the temple of God. These are instruments that are used in the presence of God, right? And the king and his lords, his wives and the concubines drank from them. And they drank wine and praised the gods of gold, silver, bronze, and iron, wood, and stone. And last night we read that, and I was talking to Eddie about it, and Eddie said, look at that. I had never seen that before. What was that What was that uh, revelation you had, Eddie? Yeah, it was the, this uh, is, he's talking about the image that was of gold and silver, and bronze, and iron, and even makes reference to the stone. So it seems to indicate that the, there, the, even though Nebuchadnezzar had come to a point where we felt like he was converted, uh, his grandson had turned out all of that dream into his own uh, his own god, individual gods. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's sort of it, it's so interesting. That he basically, yeah, is going down the the, the image <laughs> that was given to his father. Yeah, as it goes, gold, silver, bronze, iron, right? It's going down to the, the, uh, the metals. And the metals are representing systems that God, that, that men put together, right? Babylon is a system of government, and so, was, so will Medo-Persia be. And so all these are systems of men. And, and in the end, the stone smashes them all and they go away because it's replaced by uh, the system of God or by Jesus Christ. But... Uh, uh, so they're taking the vessels which are dedicated to God and they are treating them with the best, you can say, of disrespect. But something else I noticed here, when he called for these, when he called for the uh, vessels and when he called, to, when he told them to let's praise these other gods, what is, what is Belshazzar acting like now? Is he acting like a king? Or is he acting like a priest? And it's a trick question. <laughs> because he's doing both, right? He's he's commanding from the point of being a king, but he's leading these people in worship like a priest. Yep. And who else is a key, uh, <laughs> who's known as a priest and a king? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus is the priest and king. And in the Hebrews, it talks about him being the, in the order of Melchizedek, because Melchizedek was uh, the king of Salem, I believe, and, and, and the priest that uh, Abraham took his tithes to. But uh, this is, yes, we're talking about Jesus. In a way, not only is the king stepping in, uh, yes, uh, putting in God's face, he's also doing something that's really, really reserved for Jesus to be and uh, uh, there was somebody that hit me last night i'm thinking wow he's really he's really taking pride to the next level right uh in in israel you see a lot of times when a when a priest when a king will decide they're going to go worship they want to lead worship bad things happen to them right they get leprosy or other things <laughs> so we should not be surprised that something bad happens here i don't think um Part of this, it seems to be trying to say our gods are better than your gods, just like Nebuchadnezzar did in Daniel 3. Um, but it's also looking at how they're approaching God, right? 
And before, remember we said, we said when Moses brought the tables of stone, how did he approach God, you know? Was he... Um, Reverence. Huh? Reverence. Reverence, right. In fact, it says, I'm extremely afraid and trembling. I mean, this is this is a reverence thing. This is something where I want to make sure that I, when I go and I'm standing in front of a holy God, right? When Belshazzar does it, he's doing it willy-nilly <laughs> and without taking God seriously at all. Right. So, uh, it's an amazing difference, I think. So now this, this reaction here is pretty quick which I think is interesting too. In the same hour, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. And the king laughed. No. <laughs> the king's countenance changed and his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his hips were loosened and his knees knocked to get knocked against each other. This is in some ways, <laughs> some ways I think Daniel's Daniel's sort of making fun of the king here. But but this is you know it's it's, it's quite a visual image. He is he's gone from the most prideful, uh, most rebellious, uh, you know, oh, guy in the room to being the one going, oh my goodness, what have I just done? He's become I don't know. Very sober. Huh? He was shaken up by it. Very sober. Yes. Very sober. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's funny, you know, sometimes we talk about the still small voice of God. In a way, this is the still small hand of God. And in, in that there was no flashes, no big, big display. It was just a hand and writing right there. But yet he knew that it was it was big. It was an important thing. Still scary. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And although the king, he's not going to be I'm not able to interpret it, which that seems to be their problem all the time. But, <laughs> yeah. yeah, but he's really afraid. He knows that there's something's going on. Um, 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 the opposite of the lamp stand. So everybody could see it because yes. it was illuminated. Well, thank you for that. I, I've been uh, I. Yeah. So you're you're saying that there was a purpose for where God wrote so that everyone could see what it was, right? Right, with mm -hmm. light. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So if this is the old, the uh, don't hide your your lamp under a bushel, right? <laughs> He's going, <laughs> yeah, everyone can see this. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, Belshazzar, I believe, thinks he, he knows he's in the presence of the holy God who he's been mocking. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Okay, so I, I titled this next slide, Same Dance, Same Results, <laughs> because here we go again. The king cried out to bring the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers, and the king spoke, saying to the wise men of Babylon, whoever <laughs> reads this writing and tells me its in interpretation shall be clothed with purple, thus they're going to be royal, and have a chain of gold around their neck, and he shall be third ruler in the kingdom. And why third? Well, because his father is actually the over over all of Babylon, he's over the he's over the city, and this guy's gonna be number three. So now all the king's wise men came, and they could not read the writing or make known to the king its interpretation. <laughs> I don't know where I've seen this before. Uh, <laughs> sounds familiar. And, yeah. yeah. All right. Then the king, then King Belshazzar was greatly troubled. His countenance was changed and his his lords were astonished. So people are not only uh, astonished at their handwriting, they're astonished at his reaction. And and the reason I'm saying they're astonished, he, he knows, and I'm, I'm guessing he's, he's uh, all the blood's drained out of him by this time, yeah. you know. Uh, you know, have you, if you've, this is really off the cuff for me, uh, but, there's been a few times in my life when I've known I've been really, really, really close to God, right? I mean, his presence was right there with me. And that's when you're in that presence and you know it. I, I know it's there because it's a goodness that's hard to explain, but it's a goodness, you know, at least I did at the time when it came across me. I knew it was good enough to kill, right? His goodness was more than I, I could be, right? Goodness was far above me. 
And right. so he couldn't, you know, he had, there had to be a little border between me and him or else I would die. And here we see Nebuch here we see Belshazzar, he's having the same experience, I think. He knows he's really close to a holy God and he's far from it. So, and now his people can't help him. He, he's calling to people who failed him before <laughs> and they continue to do that, right? So, so up rides the queen. All right, the queen. And this is, uh, we believe this is the queen mother. This is uh, Nebuchadnezzar's daughter. And uh, she's gonna give some counsel to him. Uh, and so the queen, be because of the words of the king and his lords came to the banquet hall. So he must've heard that he was looking for the wise men again. And the queen, queen spoke saying, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts trouble you, nor let your continents change. Well, that's not too wise. But, but the next one is, there is a man in your kingdom whom, in whom is the spirit of the holy God. And in the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father, the king, made him chief of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. Uh, now, you might think that she's educating him about someone he doesn't know about, right? Because it sounds like it here. But in fact, um, people who've studied this, and maybe even more than I have, say that Daniel was probably in another province of the empire, if you will. Uh, and if you read Daniel 8, you'll see he spent some time in Shushan in the province of Elam when that prophecy was given. And they think he was probably there for a while doing the king's business. And so the Belshazzar might not, not even know he was back in town, but he probably came back in town because of the attack going on. So, so we have a background here and uh, he's going, man, so Daniel's back in town. So, so in as much as an excellent spirit, knowledge, understanding, interpreting dreams, solving riddles and explaining enigmas were found in this Daniel whom the king named Belshazzar. <laughs> now let Daniel be called and he will give you the interpretation. So she's pretty confident, isn't she? That Daniel will know what's going on. Yep. Yeah. All right. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king spoke and said to Daniel. So this is the king, Belshazzar. He's trying to make sure he's got the right guy. Are you that are Daniel? You, are you that Daniel? who is one of the captives from Judah, whom my father the king brought from Judah. I have heard of you that the spirit of God is in you and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now, do you understand that he is now basically saying, oh, yeah, I know this guy. His king, queen didn't mention Judah or anything like that, but he knows that Daniel is one of the captives brought from, you know, one of the young men brought from uh, Judah who served his father and became became this guy who had all his light and wisdom from God. Um, you know, I I interpret this as saying, "Hi, yeah, I know all the I know all the stories about you, Daniel, and that leaves me with no excuse, right? I've known I know about your God, but I've mocked him." Yeah, so, I wonder if uh, I wonder if Belshazzar uh, got direct communication from uh, Nebuchadnezzar or his uh, uh, his son you know if you know how grandfathers love to tell stories uh, I can just imagine Belteshazzar uh, hearing about the Daniel 2 dream that great image and he probably knows the story about his uh, grandfather going crazy so there, he probably knows a lot more than he's Given, given here, he probably called in the fakers because the fakers are more likely to give a smooth report, a good news type report. And so um, Daniel's last again, just like he was in Daniel too. You know, I I, I like I like that insight. And uh, did any of, you, any of you pick up on that too? Why why he would go to people who may not give him the right thing, but may give him what he wants to hear. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. 
Yeah. So, you know, in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, I believe it is, it says, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are not, they are spiritually discerned. So this is why these guys can't understand it. They don't have, they don't have the, uh, the, the key, <laughs> right? The key to understanding is having the Holy Spirit. Right. Mm. They can't understand it. So, but you're right. Now, people, people who are wise, and, and this is my counsel to all of you, right? And this is to me too. And fortunately, I have some. But we all need spiritual friends who we know are, you know, who know we know, know God and know the, you know, and have the Holy Spirit and we can, that we can go to because sometimes we all need that. We need, we need someone to guide us. We need someone to counsel with us anyway and to help us and lead us in the right way instead of the way we want to hear. Now, if I want to go to someone to say it's all right to eat a gallon of ice cream, I won't go to that person. You know, I'll, I'll go to I'll go to I'll go to Dairy Queen and they'll tell me it's all right to eat a gallon of ice cream. So, again, I can <laughs> hear what I want to hear or I can be counseled by people who are spiritual. And I think all of us need those spiritual friends in this case. Uh, Belshazzar had made a, a life of not having spiritual friends. Well, that's why fellowship was so important. Absolutely. All right. And that's why I love this group together, that we get together uh, yes. on Tuesday nights. This is great. Study. Yeah. And it says, so then, then, so Belshazzar is confessing this. Now, all the wise men, all the astrologers have been brought in before me that they should read this writing and make known to me its interpretation but they could not give the interpretation of the thing. Uh, so all, they're basically saying, all my, all my buddies can't help me. And I've heard of you, and you're right, Eddie, I'm, I'm sure Nebuchadnezzar put them on his knee and told them all these stories, uh, that you can give interpretation, explain enigmas. Now, if you can read this writing and make known to me its interpretation, ah, he's still playing the game here at this point, right? And the game is, I'm still the king, I'm in power. You shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. So uh, he is, uh, he's still trying to play, he's in charge. Uh, so Daniel gives it to him straight. And I've been reading a lot of this stuff. I don't know, would someone like to read Daniel's answer here in 17 and 18? And Daniel answered and said before the king, let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father a kingdom in majesty, glory, and honor. All right. So, I, I mean, I see here one thing, Daniel saying, your, your rewards mean nothing to me, right? When Why does Daniel right. not, not care about the rewards from him? He has God. He, he has better rewards. Coming. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. He's, he's looking for the higher rewards. Um, Another practical aspect, even if he did give it to him and he had that rulership as third in the kingdom, it's not going to last very long. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. It's like I, he already knows that. Uh, <laughs> that yeah. It's not going to be worth much. Sorry, right. not worth much. Yeah. Plus, yeah. he was but, telling the king he worked for somebody else. Yeah, he worked for somebody yeah. else. But, <laughs> and then he and then he gives them starts giving them a uh, a set. He's he given he's setting the stage. He's going now. You remember Nebuchadnezzar, you know, and and God gave him this kingdom and honor and uh, you know, and this this is something Nebuchadnezzar had to learn several times. But God was behind it. It wasn't him. Mm -hmm. uh, would someone like to read nineteen through twenty? Uh, I'll and, read you. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Angela. And because of the majesty that he gave him, all the peoples, the nations, and the language, languages trembled and feared before him. Whomever he wished, he exec executed whomever he wished. He kept alive to whomever he wished. He set up and whomever he wished, he put down. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened in pride he was disposed from his kingly throne and they took 
his glory from him. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so what do you see here? Uh, uh, there was a warning that Belshazzar has ignored, right? He's saying, listen, Nebuchadnezzar was given the kingdom, but he didn't humble himself. He was humbled and he was brought back. So not being humble is a way to lose your kingdom. And Belshazzar did not listen to that lesson, did he? Yeah. yeah. So, so no, this is all the interesting, Charlie, that, that uh, Bel Belshazzar had all of this uh, history to look at and to see, but he didn't. He didn't learn from it. Yeah. And you know, we're told by Paul that the things written before time were written for our learning and for our warning. And so Belshazzar could be just like us. If we uh, don't learn from the mistakes of the ones that went before us, um, yeah. that can be uh, just as uh, deadly. Yeah. Right. So, so Eddie, what I'm hearing from that is that we should be in our Bibles. <laughs> We should be studying what's happened before because it's going to happen again, right? In in some way, and we're gonna we're gonna face similar circumstances one way or another, and we want to make sure we make the good choices, right? Which is the good choice always begins with Jesus, right? But, yeah. uh, don't repeat, uh, don't repeat, and expand the mistakes of the of the path. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good one. Good one, Larry. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah. So. It says, then he was driven, this is talking about Nebuchadnezzar, from the sons of men, and his heart was made like the beast, and the dwelling was with the wild donkeys, and his dwelling was. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of the heaven, till he knew that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men and appoints over it whomever he chooses. Uh, so uh, I'm going to stop there for a second because I... Reminds me how often we think we're indispensable. I know I've done this many times in my life, only to find out that when I was gone, things went on without me really well. And mm -hmm. so Nebuchadnezzar probably had this thing. He thought he was the only reason Babylon was there, and you know, it turned out it went on without him but then until he came back. But you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all this. And uh, yeah. yeah, wow. So he knew it. He, he knew all of it. Yeah, yeah. He's like, he, yeah, this is. I mean, that's an important point to, to know something. You know, that, that's um, either hypocrisy or it is just uh, being stiff necked. All right. Well, yeah. this, this is. They use an old, te old testament word. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm using the. He's, he's basically saying, I'm above your God, right? I'm above your God because I'm. Going to, I'm going to take his uh, take his instruments of worship and use them for my own pleasure. Uh, I'm above him, and uh, and this is the rebuke here that comes from Daniel. Who would like to read the big Daniel rebuke here? I'll read it. Okay. And you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of Heaven. They have brought the vessels of His house before you, and you and your lords, your wives, your concubines have drunk wine from them and you have praised the gods of silver gold bronze and iron wood and stone which do not see or hear or know and the god who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways you have not glorified then the fingers of the hand were sent from him and this writing was written not only had he failed to humble his heart, but he went further mocking God and lifted up against God. Uh, if you read the descriptions of Lucifer, you know, this is a description of, of Lucifer, right? Who thought he was better than God, right? He, wanted to be, he wants to be in God's place. Yes. So, so to do this, he profanes God's sacred vessels uh, by drinking unholy things from them, if you will, uh, that came from the temple and praising idols. Uh, and thus he's actually praising the created thing instead of the creator. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, so this is an important thing for us to think about that, yeah, we, especially as we go on, we're gonna, we're gonna see more of this, especially in Revelation, but thinking about 
praising the creator or praising created things is going to be an important point there. And, but we have to avoid this Bel Belshazzar mistake. Uh, it, humbleness is a very good trait for Christians, don't you think? Um, yes. But what he tells him is you forgot that he has your breath, right? He has your breath. <laughs> and what, you know, what, what is breath in, you know, in, in Israel, that's life, right? That's the spirit. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so he, he has every right to, to say he owns you because he holds that every breath we take. And that's something I try to remember every day that, you know, uh, every day is a gift and, and that his breath Amen. is a gift to us. Right. So, okay. So then Daniel gets down to the point. He says, and this is the inscription that was written. Mini, mini, tekel, you farsen. Uh, mini is a verb, means to number. Uh, tekel is a verb, means to weigh. And uh, eupharsin is a, is a plural of the word paris, which means to divide. And so it's plural because I think they're going to give it to the Medes and the Persians. So I think that's why it was there. But, and then he gives the interpretation, right? Mini, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Uh, Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Found wanting. Yeah. And Paris, your kingdom been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Um, I look at this and going, how often have I thought that when I was younger, you know, you're, you're in your teens and you think you're going to live forever, right? But, you know, if you go to any cemetery, you have stones which have, they were born on this date and they died on that date. There was this you can count the number of days they had, right? We all, <laughs> until Jesus comes, we have a certain number of days. Uh, Belshazzar probably was in the in the habit of thinking he could he was going to live forever, uh, but he has numbered it and found that it was not, it was found wanting. Now, what sort of scene is it when you are weighed in the balances? You know what what's going on? And judged judgment judge, judgment exactly this is a judgment scene and belshazzar as daniel has said you knew all this stuff and yet you did the other so they're there he's standing in front of god with no excuse and coming up short now how many of how many of you would stand in front of god and were weighing the balance will you come up short not me and, okay and, and, and why not old bragging larry <laughs> no he accepted jesus and jesus yeah, went. that's right amen because you're not going to be the one weighed that's right they're going to weigh jesus and you're not going to be found wanting because jesus is perfect right so you'll be standing in his white robe of righteousness and so wow. when we stand before god you know, look at these two two instances I told you before. You had Moses coming before God, and you have Belshazzar coming before God. Moses went down to the camp, and he was glowing because you know his he was letting God flow through him. Belshazzar goes away to die, uh, and I think that's important for us as we go toward Revelation, right, to, to understand that. And speaking of Revelation, quickly. I think that we do need to take a peek at Revelation because Babylon is mentioned over and over again in Revelation. And it's important for us to say, oh, why are we studying Daniel? Well, because this is where we see what happened to physical Babylon, if you will. Uh, and just two instances I want to talk about. Babylon has fallen and who can stand <laughs> these references. So in Revelation 14 and 18, when we get there, it's going to tell you that Babylon has fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Do you understand why this says this from our study now? You see the wine, right, of Babylon here, and you see what it's all, the fornication is, it's all false worship, right? They're worshiping false gods with the vessels of a holy god 
So there is lines of the fornication. It's a mixing of things that should never be mixed. And so we'll get more into this when we get there. But Babylon uses holy vessels to profane God and glorify created things instead of the creator. Belshazzar uses holy vessels to promote unholy things uh, wrapped in the wrapped in the God's you know, holy vessels. But he worships with false gods. And I think this is going to come in. You know, when we think about this, when we get into Revelation, this is going to be an important concept to think about. There's that's such a great preview to uh, to the Revelation. Right. This Charlie. Uh... Right, and, and thank you. Uh, and uh, a little hint, by the way, in Babylon is fallen is fallen. Uh, those two words put together like that in the original is actually a future future perfect sort of tense which means it hasn't happened yet, but it's sure to happen, <laughs> if you know what I mean, right? So that's why in Revelation, there's a Babylon that's going to surely fall. In Daniel, we see the Babylon that, that does fall. And it's just as sure as, as it fell, will this new Babylon fall? Yeah. All right. And then who is able to stand? And I think this is something that's very important for us because in this case, we see two different types of people. We see Belshazzar, who is a king, and he is shaking, and he is uncomfortable. And so you might think of them like the people in Revelation 6, when they see Jesus coming, it says, and the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave, every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Uh, that's actually the end of chapter 6, and then the answer to that question is in 7. Who can stand? But the kings of the earth, doesn't matter your position. Belshazzar is a king, but he cannot stand in the presence of a holy God. We see Daniel, we see Moses, however, they were able to stand. And there's a difference. It says, and after this, these things, I looked and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, people, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And what is their outstanding characteristic, by the way? It's right here. They're clothed in white robes. What does that mean? They've accepted uh Jesus and their uh, sins are all clean. Right. They are covered away. with Jesus' righteousness covers them. And so, yeah, Jesus lives in their hearts with palm branches in their hands. And Eddie, you were the one talking about palm branches. You put them down before uh, royalty, right? I think you said that. Yeah. If you think about the palm branches, you know, you think of Palm Sunday. Everybody's uh -huh. familiar with that which kind of signifies the coming of uh, Jesus into Jerusalem and the mm -hmm. palm branches that, that uh, were waved and put in front of the, the, the donkey as he rode into Jerusalem. This was a kind of a scene of power. You know, they thought Jesus was coming in to become their new king. Yeah. And it says that but these people here, the great multitude, are crying out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. These people are welcoming Jesus, whereas the kings of the earth over here are running from him, falling from him. Isn't it so, interesting at the end of 16 as well that, you know, we don't often see wrath of the Lamb, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, and it's, it's, it's a funny phrase if you just take it out of context like that. But it's also because when you see the when we see the, the lamb that was slain the first time in Revelation 5, the whole universe screams worthy is the lamb, right? And no one was I... able to do what Jesus has done until he, he was he was the lamb that was slain. And he's now is working on putting it into sin, but I'm getting way ahead of myself. That's revelation. And I tried to uh, lead you uh, way ahead with that comment as well. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 
then Belshazzar gave the command. So why did why did why did uh, Belshazzar said I'm going to give you this stuff if you can do it? So he's basically saying here uh, to give him the purple robe, to give him the chain, and to make him the third ruler. And basically he's saying, Daniel, you are right. What you said is absolutely correct. And it's just like every knee shall bow when Jesus comes. The unrighteous and the righteous will all say God was right. And there Belshazzar is admitting that he's right. Yeah. Okay. And then Medo Persia takes over. Uh, that very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being 62 years old. Uh, after, in, version, in Daniel 2, it says, But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, and then another, a third kingdom, and shall rule over it. If you look over the history of Babylon, it's just like we say. We see the Neo-Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar, it shows the Persians and Medo-Persians taking over and they fight back and forth because Babylon tries to break free but never can and then until then the Greeks take over, right? So if I've given that away, sorry, but the Greeks, <laughs> just like it's just like it's, it was foretold. Um, uh, so... So here's the question. Was the fall of Babylon a surprise? No. Prophesied. <laughs> Prophesied, yeah. yeah. And Jesus said this in John 14. He says, And now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. Uh, we have been given a great, a great gift in the prophecies of Daniel because everyone, every time they've come to pass, it gives us more faith in what's going to happen in the future. And so that's that's why these prophecies are there. So we, we say, oh, God told us it's going to happen. It happened. And so the next thing we see, God says that's going to happen. It hadn't happened yet, but we know it's going to happen. Right? So it's a, it's a real faith builder for us. Yeah, Charlie, last uh, year when we did, <clears throat> did this for the first time, we were able to kind of see where we are in uh, Bible prophecy. Daniel 2 tells us pretty clear we're in the ten toes of that image. Uh, the next kingdom that comes will be uh, the Christ kingdom when he comes the second time. And then as we progress through Revelation, we could see through history being fulfilled that was prophecy to John but to us, it's history. But all of that history was fulfilled. And we were able to kind of see almost to the verse where we are in the stream of things as it relates to Revelation. Yeah. And uh, that gives, just like Jesus said here, he, he, he tells us before. And the reason is so that we'll believe him. You know, what better way to believe uh, the Bible than to study prophecies? Yeah. I think that's what's so amazing about Daniel 2 is that we can look at history and we can see dates for all of these things that was prophesied. And it, it's amazing. So we know that God knows what he's talking about and that we can believe that he's what he what he says when he says what's coming. Well, I was looking yeah. at a very, very spiritual book, Wikipedia. And <laughs> And what's amazing about it is you would think they were quoting Daniel when they talk about the history of Babylon and what's going on. So it, it's uh, they they unwittingly support the Bible yeah. <laughs> in that way. How can people yeah. think it's not true? It's right. just amazing. Now I'm yeah, gonna Barbara. Answer. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Barbara talking about the, the dates. When we get to Daniel 9, we're going to see a most remarkable timeline. Yeah that actually tells the date when Jesus would come on the scene yeah. and when Jesus would be crucified and when the gospel message would go to the Gentiles. Uh, that's the 70 week prophecy, a little preview of that. That's one reason we really want you guys to be here for Daniel seven, eight and nine, because that really sets us up for a trusting prophecy. First of all, but then to see how it ties in with latter-day events in Revelation. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. And this tells us, uh, you know, the prophecy really is a reminder to be prepared. We don't know the day nor the hour. Right. Yes, that's when true. When the Lord comes back. Yeah, yes. I, guess, I, I guess Belshazzar wasn't thinking that was his last day, right? No, that's right. <laughs> he didn't have a clue that was his last day, but no. it was. You know, Jesus said in an hour that you think not, the Son of Man comes. So we are to be ready uh, all the time. You know? Sure. We are ready all the time if we're walking with Jesus daily. Right. Yes. I, I want to take a moment before we left, and I realize that we're right at the end here. What are some of the key takeaways for you from this study? And I, I sort of give you some bubbles to think about, but it, does anything jump out at you? Would that be Evelyn or Barbara or Shelton or? Prophecy Amy? fulfilled, like I just said, that's amazing okay. to me. That's just so yeah. undeniable. Yeah, I am so impressed with this whole thing about, you know, when you look at Isaiah and Jeremiah and, uh, and Daniel and all the things that went on to be fulfilled there and still are being fulfilled. And, then, and also long suffering. It shows how merciful and patient and loving that God really is. Right. If you, if you think about, yeah, the long suffering of, to Babylon and how he tried to bring those guys back around and yeah. worked hard, worked hard at it. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, long suffering. Yeah, exactly. And the sin of pride is mm -hmm. still alive and well today. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. The beginning, <laughs> of, uh, the beginning of the end, as Psalms tells us sometimes. Well, pride, pride actually began earlier than the story right now because it began when Solomon showed off his riches to other kingdoms. That's right. You know, they, came to, they came to see what was going on with Solomon because amazing things were happening they heard of it what's who's this god of israel and instead of showing him the god of israel he showed him his riches yeah. and the babylonians remembered that that there were great riches there and came and got them right so that was part of it but then you had nebuchadnezzar he had his statue and then you had this is mighty babylon and then you have belshazzar who uh just called out god and mocked him um, and his pride, and the pride goeth before fall. Not That's right. it. And he fell that night. Yes, he did. All the way. Yeah. And and I like that the who can stand, because you realize that all of us at some point, we're going to stand, right? We have to stand before God. <laughs> who can stand? And, and the answer is, you know, if you've given your heart to Jesus, you know, you can, you'll be able to be there. That's the um, only way we can stand. Right. You know, you, you just reminded me of Daniel 12, the final chapter, where it says in that day, Michael, referring to Christ, shall stand up. <laughs> oh. So uh, he's going to stand. It says he stands up for his people. Absolutely. So, yeah, we might be, have to stand, but we're going to have Jesus standing there beside us. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. You know, we, we, we see that in, in the Old Testament where it talks about how Satan is the accuser of of, of God's people and and Jesus stands there and Michael stands there if you will and says I covered him therefore you can't you know he's, he's safe you, you you can't be the he's advocate. advocate he's their advocate <laughs> advocate exactly yeah. uh, what about worship what does this thing tell you about worship well Belteshazzar managed to break <laughs> all the rules about rush, uh, worship <laughs> Yeah, yeah. He, had a, he had false gods, uh, you know. Uh, is, is worship important to God? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think this is Very. one of the things that we have to understand is this is telling worship is important. And it does matter to him if you bring people to the creator rather than to created things. It matters to him, right? And uh, It matters to us, too. Absolutely. Because it changes our whole life. It if does. If created things, you know, our life is really pretty bad in the end. Uh, no matter how much money we might have, we might have lots of money, but how many people with lots of money have killed themselves? Yeah. And and then there's holy things. You know, we we think about the holy vessels, and and I was thinking about this when we started this lesson. You know, the word of God is holy, and how we use it, we have to use it correctly. You know, we have to use it to illuminate Jesus to others. Uh, if we use it any other, if we use it for our own purposes. Then we're not using holy things correctly. So, right. uh, there's uh, 
There's a lot about using holiness. Well, thank you for that. Thank you for participating and things to take away from this chapter. Uh, next week, we're going to Daniel 6. And I think, uh, Larry, you're Larry. Daniel 6? Yes. And so I'm going to give, I'm going to give it away. <laughs> yeah. Daniel is seen by Darius as a distinguished young man with no faults. And um, actually, he's older. He's not young anymore. Uh, <laughs> and the governors and satraps don't like it because Daniel's getting uh, way up in the thing. And so they set a trap. They're jealous. They're jealous. And they set a trap. And they set a trap in him. And the only way they can find fault in that he worships yep. God. And so he gets caught because he doesn't stop praying to God. He still witnesses about how good God is. And then he's cast in the lion's den. And we know the rest of the story, right? And uh, God right. prospers Daniel in the end. Okay. So that... Uh, that's our lesson for today. Our this, this session, I don't know it's lesson, but this is our time together. And I so appreciate everyone. Thank you so much. I appreciate you uh, being being here uh, with all my heart. And thank you for discussing things. And you know, thank, thank you, Charlie. Great yeah. lesson. Thank you. All right. Good night, everyone. We'll see you good night, week. everyone. Okay. See you next week. Same, time, same channel. <laughs> good evening.